So we're going to uh, start off right at hand. And uh, unlike yesterday, I don't know the people up here except for David. So I'm going to start with Mike Stanhope from Mike's Mac Shack. Hello. How are you doing? Give a round of applause, please. Sean, uh-oh, I can't read my own writing now. Mousy. Mousy from Action Retro. Yes. Hello. David Murray, the 8-bit guy. And Steve Mazarazzo from Mac 84. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Mazarazzo. So, um, so the topic for today is uh, webcasters, and we've got quite a wide range here. We've got a lot of Apple up here today, and that's okay. <laughs> oh. I'm getting better at it. If it makes you feel any better, I go both ways. <laughs> what, both 8 and 16? Yeah, that works. Oh. <laughs> so the first question I have, and I'll throw this to David, how many projects do you have going at one time? Too many to count. Right. <laughs> I really so don't. Do, do you have like three or four major ones, or is it like next month's in the queue while you're working on this month's, or just too many to count? I usually have at least one or two that are like front burner, like I'm working right. on right now, and then I usually have three or four back burner, and then like a hundred that, you know, down the road that I'm like, oh, I need to make sure I get this part, or get this thing, or find out this research, bef you know. Before I bump this up to, to back burner and then eventually to front burner. <laughs> right, right, right. Mike, same question. Uh, how many uh, do you have going at a time? Oh, everything's a project. That's the problem. Right. So, but I've got like three of them that I'm working on. I have a compact portable right now. It's just been kicking me in the butt. Those well, are fun. Do, do you ever get so you're three quarters of the way into it and go... I can't make a video of this? Yeah, that's my compact portable right. It was actually supposed to come to VCF with me this this weekend, and the floppy drive controller just decided to die, and it's just fighting me every step of the way, right. which is typical of those things, you know. By, by the way, you have one of my favorite shots on the Internet, and that's you getting electrocuted. Was that you? Yes. That's, yeah. So there's one of me getting electrocuted, and there's one of Steve over there freaking out over an exploding Rifa cap, which is, yeah. has got to be like the absolute oh, funniest you. thing in the world. In my defense, it sizzled, and it scared the crap out of me. I watch that clip daily for inspiration. <laughs> cool. well, well, to you then, uh, name a time you got the crap scared out of you, Lene. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> Let's see, last week, and no. Um, so if anyone's familiar with the PowerBook Duo, there is a dock that Apple sold that was almost comically expensive compared to like a used desktop. But anyway, there's a dock, and it sort of loads the, the laptop like a VCR, and it you know, gives you monitor access and new bus slots and a hard drive, et cetera. And so I picked up this uh, PowerBook Duo um, dock from someone on Reddit who was just going to toss it. And there's two caps in the power supply that usually go, so I replaced those. And still, there was no signs of life. So I'm fiddling with this thing for hours and hours and hours. And I have, like, a camera off to the side recording it. And um, I guess the rubber feet on the bottom of the PowerBook were so sticky, it didn't let the PowerBook go in all the way. And just magically, it just made a connection. And the motor went, vroom, vroom, and I was, like, two millimeters away from the, the motor. And I'm like, Duh! and I'm surprised the table didn't flip over. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just like, oops. Yeah. Now, now, were you two together when he got shocked? Or you, your reaction I was, I was reaction? watching. You were watching. I actually, I did that live, but we were together when he uh, freaked out over the reefer cap exploding. Okay, in my defense, <laughs> there is no defense. You've, you've been around so many reefer caps exploding. Well, they, How is this new? They popped. That one popped, sizzled, and cracked, it did. and it, smoked. It did. It went up bad. To, yeah, that was... And the computer wasn't even on, which was even worse. The best part was I, I pointed the camera towards it like five seconds before it did it. So at least there's some embarrassing evidence. And the smell of those reefers are always... Oh, yeah. Great, oh, my great God. fragrance. It's I, I heard there's a candle they're working on. That's yeah, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, have you ever burned something up on camera or been shocked or knocked on your ass? Or? I don't think I've been shocked, but I've, I've certainly uh, uh, burned a few things up, broken a few, you know, at least one CRT. Uh, you know, yeah, I've had my share. Yeah. Was that the, who, who knocked the neck off the CRT? Was that you? That was me. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
I think a couple of us have done that. It's, it's, it's an experience. There's a lot of things we've done that we're like stupid ashamed of after the fact. Okay, like what? Oh. <laughs> you walked into that one, Steve. I, 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 I plead the fifth. <laughs> There's no mistakes, only happy accidents. Yeah, no, no. So, okay. Um, let's see. Back in 1997. Uh, no. Jeez. Right? No, um, I mean, just like, you know, you give something away that you don't know how to fix, and then, like, it's like, oh, yeah, that's some ultra-rare thing that there's only three of on this earth, and you're like, oh, yeah, I should have asked for more than a dollar for that, you know? <laughs> so, Sean, what, what have, have you done something where y you get into it, and you go, oh, this is cool, I, where the light bulb comes on as to what the original designer had or anything in mind? So, I mean, I'm not, like, okay, so if... We were to rank the uh, abilities of the people up on stage. I think I'd come in last as far as like engineering goes, right? <laughs> so I'm kind of winging it. So I get those revelations not so much when I'm working on something, right. but when I'm watching somebody else work on something. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's so much good stuff on YouTube these days. Like I'll tell you, Usagi Electric is here. Yes. I'm so excited because yes. I've just. So much stuff that clicked for me, just watching him restore that Centurion. Yeah, um, but yeah, so not not quite the the answer, but yeah. Right, right. So you know, there's a line between entertainment and education, right? And David, I I feel educated when I watch one of one of your videos. Well, that's uh, humbling. <laughs> yeah. So. So, what considerations go into? I, I know you also write script. Does everybody here write scripts, or do you wing it when you're on? on? It depends on the content. I, I script yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a winger. Half of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, do you wing sometimes, or do you pretty much script out everything? Um, you know, most things are script out. I mean, some sometimes, like when you see me switch to, um, like most of the time, you'll hear me narrating, and then every now and then you'll hear like the voice sounds a little different when I'm showing something. It's because I'm. I was talking to the camera while I did right. it. And a lot of the times I narrate over that, but sometimes I'm like, hey, you know, that sounds good enough. I'll just leave it in there, you know? And so, right, right. so there's little bits of winging it, so to speak, but overall there's usually a script. Right. Yeah. Uh, same question to you. Uh, it, it, well, actually, I didn't get through the question, but the, um, the, when you plan on doing it, do you plan on it being entertaining or educational and let the entertainment come through the education. Yeah, I think I think what, what really I enjoy about, especially like the vintage Apple stuff and things like that is, you know, I grew up with these machines and always got made fun of by my friends because they were all PC nerds and that's cool and all, but I, I was, you know, I had a Mac at home. That's all I had. I couldn't afford a PC or anything. So um, I, 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 Wait kept, a minute. I, I kept like, you know, understanding these things by, by getting books from libraries and everything and just like, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, you reset the PRAM by holding down this and this and that. And so it's like, all this stuff is ingrained in my brain, for better or worse. I don't know my license plate, but you know, whatever. That's, you could find that out by writing it down. But, um, you know, I want to be able to share some of this information, some of the, like the do's and don'ts, some of the things I figured out along the way. And so I, I try and make the videos as ed educational as possible. I mean, sometimes it's just like, hey, this is a cool thing. I just want to talk about this cool thing. I don't know what it is. Maybe you could tell me. And, and I'll get some great feedback on that or, or get some, some person that knows a lot about it, which is fantastic because the whole point of me being interested in this stuff is learning about it, documenting things, archiving things. So the next person who's interested in this stuff, there's, there's something there for them to go off of because we've all been there where we find a picture of something or a board and we're like, well, there's like no markings on this. What the heck is this? <laughs> right. And then that, that goes in your to-do pile and it sits there for a decade. But, you know, I, I think I, I do like to try and at least give like a bit of an education of, hey, here's a history of it for a few minutes and then go on and play with it and see what right. happens. Right, right. Yeah, I'm going to ask this question to everybody, Mike. What... Uh, do you entertain and then educate, or educate well, and entertain, or only when one? I do a like a regular video, like a pre-planned video, which unfortunately I haven't done one in recent time. I try to be more on the educational side, but like when I'm doing a live stream, which I do more often these days, it's more of entertainment first than education, you know, because. I might not, I don't even know what I'm doing half the time. So right. how am I going to educate somebody, you know, if I'm fixing something, you know, a lot of times I'm fixing something that I want to use later on, you know, you watch me either blow myself up, which, you know, <laughs> which has is happened on more than one occasion, <laughs> yeah. or you, you learn, it's like, 
don't touch that. <laughs> That's right. really not a good thing to touch on a PowerBook 500 power supply when it's right, plugged right, into right. the wall. You know, so at least there's both, you know, so. But like when I do a regular video, I'm, it's more for, I'm, I'm going to say it's more for the entertainment, or oh, I'm yeah. sorry, more for the education, education. than the entertainment. Right, so. right. I try to be entertaining while educating. I try know, to, I, too, I, but I unfortunately, I, you know, I don't script anything. Right. I, I just, I talk off the top of my head. I don't do this for a living. So, you know, I, I don't really care. It's just a <laughs> hobby to me. So, right. you know, I'm not like Sean. I, you know, I only got like 1,400 subscribers or something to his 50,000. So, 61. <laughs> I know where you live. So, you might want to be careful. We okay. live in the same state. <laughs> Don't and pick I, any up, up any capacitors that might be charged, yeah. is what he's saying. You, you might find a one ferrite capacitor in the back seat of your car tomorrow. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so, Sean, how about you? Yeah, uh, so I, I try to like kind of weave it in, and it's kind of the reason I, I really started scripting the videos out. Like, I really enjoy learning. Like, I have an idea, like, I want to upgrade a certain computer in a certain way, and I know some of it is possible, so... It gets me to do a lot of research into everything that goes into the upgrade, that goes into the machine, the history, the community, you know, where the upgrade came from, how people have used it in the past. And then I try to weave it into the script as I go. Generally, I'll script like the first half of the video, and I'll try to put a lot of you know, fact-checked information in there. And wait, then when wait, I get wait, 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 you, you check your facts? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. You gotta write Can't that down. be wrong on a video is, is kind of my attitude. Yeah. Because it stays there and it's always Oops. wrong from that moment on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Alan Wolke, are you in the audience? Oh, can you have a microphone real quick? So, Alan Wolke is with us, a famous YouTuber in his own right. Big round of applause. I'm going to give you the same question because I get highly educated off your stuff. <laughs> well, uh, I don't do any streaming. And, uh, and I try to, I look at other, uh, my YouTube channel is more about analog electronics, RF, ham radio, test and measurement type stuff. And there's a lot of guys out there doing that kind of thing. And some of them go off on rants and things like that. And I, I really try to make, you know, try to avoid doing that and try to just compact as much educational material in as short a time period as possible. Right, because I, you know, I don't try to make you know hour-long videos. I try right. to make five or ten-minute-long videos. They're just packed with just the information, and that's it. No fluff or anything like that. So, I'm, right. if it's entertaining, great. Right. So, but it's, <laughs> otherwise, it's you know. Right, and you, uh, I mean, we mentioned yesterday you used a piece of technology that I searched for. I kept trying to find the perfect whiteboard to yeah. to like draw in the air. I wanted to draw in the air and stuff. And you use a pad of paper and I, I, use, I use a pad and paper. What I wound up doing since I was burning through quadrule pads, you know, like, like I was burning trees, I wound up finding something called a rocket book, which is basically a, a quadrule pad that is basically vinyl and you write on it with Flexion pens. Right. And you can erase it and just reuse it. And I've got a little app that'll just scan them into PDF files and cool. you know, but the hand drawn stuff to me it just it just makes it you know, it's like a lab notebook. Right. right? So that's right. And when, if you ever watch my videos, you very rarely see me in front of the camera. It's like the camera is sitting here, and I'm doing stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. So I try to make it like you're in the lab with me. So here's my lab notebook. Here's the stuff I'm doing. You're seeing how it's done. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So anybody else do that? Do they shoot around the camera, uh, you know, uh, to, so you can focus on the object? Or do you have down cameras? Or how do you show what you're working on? Oh, that's been a difficult thing to try to figure out. Right? I mean, that's uh, why we're here. And especially, like, equipment-wise. Like, I started out just with my phone. So I have my phone, like, on a stand over top, and I'm, like, working around it, which is kind of hard. Uh, I mean, I kind of settled on just moving the camera around whenever I'm doing something. So I'll do, like, my face shot explaining something and then move the camera over top and then film me, you know, working around it. Right. You right. should see the contortion positions I have to get into <laughs> to solder on camera. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Because the camera has to be here and you can't block the light and yet you somehow have to move around the tripod and so sometimes I'm down on my knees and the item I'm soldering is here and my hand is around the tripod <laughs> And my, you know, sometimes I'm shaking a little bit, right? And right. people don't know why. Like, 
do you have Parkinson's, David? No, I'm just, you should see the positions I'm in. Sorry, these things. Right. Soldering yoga. Yeah. So, what, what kind of camera do you use? Nowadays, I use my iPhone for almost yeah. everything. Yeah, everybody, uh, what do you guys use for your for shooting? Uh, I have a, uh, oh, sorry, Mike. Well, you have that fancy thing. Well, I, have a, I, I got a, a, a secondhand Panasonic Lumix DH5S for the sole purpose of recording uh, and syncing to the scan lines of like a CRT. And who um, gave you that idea for that camera? You. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it really helps a lot. But before that, I was using the iPhone, which I, I still use for like pickup shops or things that don't involve a CRT. It's just like, I just put it on the tripod. It, the quality is great from it. I mean, really, really, it's it's... I encourage anybody to just like use what you got. Like I, I used it before that. I used a DSLR that had like a ten minute video limit because of some regulation or something. Because <laughs> it wasn't a video camera, um, and oh, so like every ten minutes or fifteen minutes or whatever it was, like the light went off and it stopped recording, which was great when you're in the middle of something. Like, you know, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, ages ago, I bought a used uh, Panasonic GH4. Yeah, just a regular GH4 based off of a LGR video. Where yeah, it said exactly. That syncs to you know it has a synchro scan feature, so you can tune it to a. CRT's refresh rate, uh, and I've just been using that, plus my, uh, I have an Android phone, <gasps> yeah, so, yeah. Well, do you get into a problem where if you shoot it in one camera, how, how does the iPhone I am not the... that fancy. Okay. I, if, 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 you, if you could hear me, and, and the video <laughs> is like, you know, decently the same, then I'm sure. <laughs> but I, I, I try not to like focus. I know there's a, there's a lot of awesome videos I watch where they're color graded and the, the shadows are fine and this and that. And it's like I have enough struggle just editing the darn thing afterwards. Right. So if as long as like you could like tell what I'm pointing at or you know the lighting is decent where I could like just post the audio or the video a little bit. Like I don't do, go too crazy because I'm I will be a perfectionist in that and the video will never get done. <laughs> right, right. How about you, Mike? I just use a, my iPhone because I used to have a, I had a Sony Alpha A5000, I believe it was. It right. was an older model. And beautiful video, lousy audio. But it would overheat after about 15 minutes. <laughs> Every 15 minutes or so, it would get so hot that it would just shut down. And eventually I got tired of it and just started, I started using my iPhone 10 a couple years ago, and now, I mean, I have an iPhone 14, which has probably got better optics than a Sony does. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and, and I've found that if I use a Bluetooth, I have a Bluetooth boom headset that I can use, and the audio is wonderful, so, compared to what I had, so. Right. So, you all record to SD cards, basically? Yeah. As opposed to through a video switcher? Well, I, I just... Well, my iPhone just record right to the right cloud. Right, yeah, to flash. But, I, I would yeah. love to have the excuse to have multiple cameras and a video switcher and everything, but I, I just got the one. <laughs> right. I, I don't want that stuff. I want it as simple as possible. So yeah. I have a, like this little audio mixer preamp thing that goes on top of my camera, and that goes right into the camera, and I just record everything with the SD card. Okay. It works and sounds pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, what was hit on in, in yesterday's panel was like, you will watch a video with lousy video but good audio. I have right. heard that. And that's one of the things that I, I got one of those, uh, I think the wireless go mics or whatever, and it's like, oh, okay, you could actually hear me. That's great. Yeah, let's, <laughs> right, let's keep right, using that. <laughs> right. So we have another up uh, on, on uh, uh, web streaming personality, Thomas Cherry Holmes. Uh, Thomas, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, he needs a quick round of applause. He needs a microphone. What's, what's your uh, setup look like? My setup, uh, ironically, is entirely inside of OBS because I work entirely in context of showing emulators in action or running systems in action. So everything I have is either capture cards bouncing into, in, into OBS, and I do all of my switching in real time. So it worked very different from the way that you all work. So. Right, right. And I work that way. I, I have multiple cameras and I have a little portable thing and I punch camera two and yes. then I'll shoot till I like that shot mm -hmm. and I put it in the editor and then I go on to the next day. Because if I don't, I get my continuity all messed up. Well, since I, have, since I have all of my subject matter in my head and I know my subject matter very well, I do everything in one, in one big shot. I used to do that and then I got old. <laughs> <laughs> So. Yeah, it went downhill. It was, no. it was sad. It was. 
Shit happens. So, do you, do, <laughs> well, it happened to this guy on camera. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you. So, do any of you guys run capture cards, or any? Do you, how do you capture the video, or do you capture the video of your computer device under test to to the web stream or to the stream? Well, I guess I'll I'll comment on that. So, um, I I rely heavily on emulators. Okay. When I can, right. if I can show something in an emulator and capture that, I that's usually my go-to. But if I need to capture from the real thing, I have a variety of. Capture devices that can capture various analog sources that I, I uh, like. I'll use. Like what? I'll, I'll go ahead and ask. Like AVR Media or Black Magic or. I actually have like a twenty-year-old Dazzle thing that I have was, one you know, of those. that I yes. still use. It was made in like nineteen ninety-nine. I got one works. in the free pile today. <laughs> and the sad part is, like a lot of these, like if you go on eBay or Amazon and you buy a, just like a twenty-dollar capture device, it won't have as good of capture as the twenty-year-old ones. So. I'd just use the older one. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me more about em emulation then. Why, why do you, you, so you're showing the computer experience to the people when you're emulating as opposed to here's a Mac and you're wiping the, the housing off or something? Well, it depends on what I'm showing, but a lot of the times I'm showing software. And uh, I can just get the cleanest picture that way from an emulator. Right. Uh, you know, and if, if the emulator has the option to have, you know, CRT uh, look to it, then I usually have that enabled. But quite often, I'll, have, I'll even have the real machine that you'll see, like, on my bench running a game I'm talking about, well, I don't know, Gianna Sisters or something like that. And then it'll switch to full screen. And what a lot of people don't realize is, I played the game on the real machine, and then I went and played the game again on the emulator, <laughs> and then I kind of merged it so that it looks like we just switched camera angles, but we really didn't. I uh, recorded the whole thing twice. Right. Movie magic. <laughs> Anybody else use emulation, or is it really all about the old Mac, the old experience? Or? So it's something that I've fought with a lot. I think Steve has it pretty locked down. I have this Elgato external thing that I found works very good. Uh, and then I have this, like, string of adapters to go from, like, VGA or, like... Um, you know, whatever the computer has, through like four different adapters into this Elgato thing, into OBS, but it's such a pain to figure it out and to try like a couple different, like in the middle adapters that half the time I just wind up filming the screen. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah, so my, my alternative to OBS is I use XSplit. And so it's a subscription, but it, it's, uh, it does all the same thing. Yeah, I mean, the challenge of, of that is, is time, you know. It, as David's using emulation, that's awesome. Because it's like, you, you just want to get the point across. You don't have to have any bells or whistles. You, you just want to say, hey, here's what I'm talking about. Right. Um, but the issue I ran into is a lot of like the off-the-shelf capture boxes, like Sean was saying, the Elgato or whatever, they will only capture like what they're designed for. So a lot of this stuff is designed for like video game systems and 1080p, 720p, etc. You try, literally, try to take and do a capture, a monitor capture, Sun 2 or a Sun 3 works. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So, so what I figured out was, you know, taking, like, looking on, on, on forums and just trying to figure things out and looking through manuals of specs of these video scalers and things like that. And one that I found was this uh, Atlona ProLine, whatever, and it's an ancient one. But it will accept, like, the 67 hertz from a Macintosh video signal. It will upscale it to 1080p. It does a, a bang up job, it looks beautiful. Right. And it'll output HDMI, and then you could you know use whatever capture box. And since it's outputting 1080p, all, any of your your bargain basement you know capture boxes will accept that and be like, oh, this is great, I could use this. Where the problem is, if you skip that scaler step and you just go like those cheapo VGA to HDMI, it's not scaling; it's just spitting out the same signal. It's digitizing it, yeah. and you'll get a capture device going, oh, I don't know what to do with this, you know? <laughs> or you'll get like one frame per second or like weird stuff, and so like. I, I have two of those scalers, and they're a bit finicky. You know, the, 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 the documentation is like, eh. Like, you know, the one online is like not the full manual. Not all of those uh, models work the same way. You know, I made some assumptions. I did a video about it showing the whole process. Um, but, you know, some of the cheaper ones, you don't have all the resolutions or support or whatever. But I find that, like, I try and record uh, from the, the content, like, because I have, like, a VJ splitter going into the box. So right. anything I could capture from that. Um, but Emulation is great, but sometimes I'm trying to capture something that 
you could only get on hardware, like a boot sequence. Like jail bars on a 128? Yeah, yeah some, something, something, I mean, well, that would be a CRT capture, but yeah, <laughs> the same spirit of that, or a graphical glitch or something, you know, because I, I mess with odd crap, you know, nothing's going to work correctly, so. Well, just to be clear, the uh, Mr. FPGA project does have a jail bar setting, and you can actually, <laughs> so. Yeah, turned it right on to full. Does it have a CMA C Mac as well? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, David, I'm I'm actually jealous of your production uh, capability. I've seen you do animation. How how do you do that? Is that you, or do you try and find help, <laughs> or do you do it at three I'm in the morning? I'm almost embarrassed to say how I do it because every time I explain it to somebody, they, I don't. They're like, really? You do that? Why don't you use these modern tools or whatever? You know. So I, I'll tell you my secret. It, it's I use a very old paint program that I've been using since the '90s called PaintShop Pro. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. It still runs on modern Windows machines. So you know, and I know how to use it really well because I've been using it for like 20 something years. Right. And if I want to do an animation, a lot of the times what I'm doing is I'll draw like two frames. And then in the editor, I'll do like a wipe, and I'll set the wipe to go, you know, any 360 degrees you want, so that it'll wipe across. And I'll get rid of the like um, you can you can do wipes that are like one pixel like threshold or whatever. So that's how I do a lot of them. And then sometimes I just draw multiple frames, and I'll have like 20 you know PNG images, and I just dump them into the. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time on that kind of stuff, by the way. I mean, right. No, it's time yeah. intensive. That's why I'm jealous. It's, uh, I'll have like a little five second clip sometimes that I spent like four hours on. Yeah. Um, but I feel, but I only do that if I feel like this is the only way I can communicate this. And, and right. so that's, that's well. Done. well but and, I, and I appreciate that because it, it, it's helpful, like when you're talking about a subject that maybe I'm not familiar with or the viewer's not familiar with. I think the pictures and the diagrams really help sink that in because you could read an article or you could watch a video and be like, okay, that was the thing. But it's like, oh, okay, now I understand this. I mean, I see some of these animations that, you know, some of these other people do that know how to use more modern, modern tools and, and that looks pretty cool, but I'm not going to spend the next, you know, six months learning how to use those tools <laughs> to make a, you know, four second video right. clip or something like that. So that's, that's just kind of been my... <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Have you had to do any animations, or for your uh, for your intros, have you d done anything special? No. People pay me not to animate or draw things. Okay. <laughs> Same. I, I, uh, I came a, a background of like graphic arts and multimedia and animation, so I try and like sprinkle that in. But right. as David said, it's so time consuming. I mean, I I used to do flash animation, like traditional animation, like play around with that stuff, and it's like. Yeah, you could draw this 24 times and get one second out of it. And right. that's great if you don't have anything else to do in your life, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I'm trying to illustrate something like to David's point, you know, it's when I want to make something dead simple or it's the only way I could figure out how to convey this to someone in a way where it's going to sink in, where they're not going to be like, huh? And, you know? and that's why I thought of, anim you know, showing a, a coil's energy or a diode's carriers or something, you know. That and, and I think we all get jealous of, like, seeing, like, you know, these very high production YouTube videos right. where they're using, like, these great software packages and they're, and I'm like, oh, well, that would be great. But uh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> I know my limit. I'm not going to sink 80 hours into it. You know, I just want to get the point across. And if I'm using crayons, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and to that point, Alan uses a notepad very effectively. Hey, too. I like that. Yeah. So, uh, staying uh, with you, uh, how much time would you say you invest for each minute of video that, that you end up with? Oh, there's no counter anymore. No, yeah. that's the... <laughs> it just takes hours and you get a few minutes out. I mean, what drives me is, like, I, I'm, I'll be interested in something. And talking about, when we were talking about how many projects you have in the back burner, it's, like, unlimited. You know, it's like, I'll, I'll go from thing to thing and I'll get it to go as far as I can. And then it'll break. And I'm like, well, I need this part or I need to figure out this schematic or whatever. And it's like, all right, that's on the back burner. And then, ooh, shiny. And I'll go and get some, you know. <laughs> Balloons. Or, or uh, here, this place is dangerous. It's like, ooh, free pile or consignment. It's like, oh, I wonder what that CD is. And then recently I was doing a live stream of some CD I got from somewhere. And there was, like, this uh, educational Muppet keyboard it's this horrible membrane keyboard with the Muppets on it. And I'm like, I wonder if that's on eBay. $80 later, it's now in my house. <laughs> and now I have to find the software to it. But it was on an educational Apple promotional CD talking about, you know, hey, there's this way to teach your kids the, alpha, the ABC. So my poor nephew is going to be subjected to that to see how he thinks of it. But I, it's just one of those things where it's like I, I try and go from start to finish to finish a project. Right. 
very rare I'll give up completely because right. I... I know everybody loves a happy ending, and that's maybe why I don't have a great subscriber count. But things just break, <laughs> and it's like, you know what? Hey, we'll come back to it in a year or so. And if, if you're patient enough, you may see it working again. But right. there's, I mean, you, you, have, you have to draw the line sometimes. I mean, I, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to, like, trying to, like, get the video and the audio some, when I can. You know, there's things outside of my control. You, you put the camera setting on wrong, I'm not re-recording that, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think that you have to sort of set, like, a, a limit to yourself of how much you want to do with something. And, and I'll, you know, I'll record something and I'll come back and, like, I'll work on another project or something like that. Right. So it's one right. of those things where you, I, I just try and have a healthy balance to it because there's been times where I'll spend a whole weekend on something and I just burn myself out. And then I'm like, well, I'm not editing that. You know, so. Right. so I'm going to go right down the line asking a question because this is, to me, is like one of the first points about this is how time intensive it is. David, how much time would you say you, you put into each minute? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know on a minute basis. But, uh, but, I would just say my typical videos range from 40 to 80 hours for a 15 minute video. So I guess do the math. Okay, but, that's, yeah. that's about, yeah. Yeah, it's it's tremendous time. Uh, when guys, things work. What's that? When things work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's assuming you don't throw it on the floor because you never got it to work and you just say, okay, next project. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'll just say, you know, I always have people saying, well, David, why don't, why don't you upload videos more often? <laughs> Joe, Joe Bob, in his YouTube channel, he uploads twice a week. Why don't you do that? And I'm like, well, because that guy, he doesn't really edit his videos. He just, like, talks to the camera. If I did that, sure, I could upload twice a week. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah, you guys? Yeah, well, it's kind of hard to keep track because, you know, I'm not just sitting at a desk working on it the whole way through. You know, I, I do have a day job, so I'm working on it at night and on the weekends and stuff and, like, on the couch, you know, researching while I'm watching TV uh, or other YouTubers and, you know, usually other YouTubers. Uh, <clears throat> I I would guesstimate 20 hours per video, sometimes okay. a lot less, depending on the research, depending on how successful I am. Like if it keeps breaking and I have to figure it out, you know, sometimes it'll, I'll be right up to the wire for release date, filming the night before. Other times it'll go great. Video I put up a video today scheduled, did it in one day. How did I do that? I don't know. Right. <laughs> Right. I, I tell people it takes between 40 and 100 hours. I mean, that's mm. how big my spread is based on what happens. And, and you, how long do you spend? I don't get that fancy. So <laughs> You just shoot it? If, it, you know, I mean, I still put, like when I do a regular video, I mean, I still try to put some time in it so it looks right. like I'm putting some effort into it. I mean, the last, <laughs> the last actual video I did was um, basically a how-to on how to install, a, what was it, Monterey, I think, on a Mac Mini use an open core and um, I did that I actually did the whole process in a live stream which took two and a half three hours because everything is so slow and it still took me to take that live stream cut it down and make an actual like script scripted video out of it it still took me a few hours it still took me at least four hours right. in Final Cut Pro just getting everything right getting the timings right and you know right Right. And, and I've kind of cheated lately. I, I used to do, you know, these very, not scripted videos for Hackaday, but very, you know, uh, point to point. And now we, a friend of mine and me, we just turn on the camera on Fridays, you know, and, and just live stream. Does anybody here, do you do a combination of live streaming and videos or strictly? David, I've only ever seen you with videos, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't live stream. It's addictive because you get instant results. <laughs> um, and we're headed that way. Yes, you, yeah. you interact, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I started doing it, um, oh gosh, I think it was on Instagram or Facebook Live before YouTube. Because I, I, you had, to, there used to be like all these hoops you had to jump through to get a YouTube Live enabled or whatever. And so I, I started doing that. And I, I'm, I was deathly afraid of public speaking, so I don't know what the hell I was doing. But it's like, I want to talk about this stuff and I'm the only voice. So it's like, well. Can't get somebody else to do it, so might as well do it. Right. Um, and so it's just one of those things where I just kept working on it once in a while, and it, it just started to, it was fun, you know, because you get an audience, you know, you get a, it's like, ooh, two viewers, you know. Like, <laughs> and at the same time. Yeah, no, it's like, oh, the same guy left his computer on at the kitchen. Okay, well, that's, you know, <laughs> one and a half. But, you know, every, everyone starts somewhere, you know, and so, you know, gradually, you know, you, you sort of get a little bit familiar, but 
I mean, I, I do it very lighthearted. Like, things are going to break. Things are not going to go the way they go. And I think that's, like, 99% of why people watch my live streams is, like, oh, is he going to break it? Right. Ooh, is, is, is this going to blow up? Or, or he's going to go on a, a tangent looking for a cable in his basement of, that's a mess for, like, 45 minutes. You know, and he'll, he'll just put the rabbit camera on, and you can see the pet rabbit while, you know, I'm looking for that one SCSI cable that I bought at VCF three years ago, you know. So you have a rabbit? Yes. We, we, we talked about rabbits yesterday. They steal the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they also like escaping and chewing on the expensive Cab cables. Cables. Yes. Yes. They, they chew on everything. They know just the proprietary cable that, like, you have one of. And it's like, <laughs> that was delicious. Can I have another? <laughs> but I, I, I try and do a balance of, like, the live streams versus, you know, the, the, the regular videos. But I think the, the problem is the general YouTube audience does not understand, like, how much time goes into this stuff. Because I will do a live stream. I could just set up and go with some preparations. Right, you know, right. It's a half hour before I'll get like some stuff together, if I'm lucky. Um, or the stream starts, and I'm like, oh, wait, hold on. I didn't bring that downstairs. <laughs> um, but like for a regular video, it's like I'll shoot like four or five hours of this stuff, and I'll cram it down to like 20, 30 minutes. Right. And most of it's like me going, ah, you know, and just like <laughs> flubbing a line or whatever and you know, cutting most of it out. But, you know... It's, it's one of those things where you sort of have to find your own cadence to it and, right. and how you're going to do it. But I try and balance the both of them, but I think that there's audiences for both. And I think I, I will get tons of emails or whatever, like, you shouldn't do as many live videos. I'm like, well, that's great. You don't have to watch all eight hours. You know, there's chapters in there, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, you're not going to please everybody. And right. I, just, I just try and do, if I'm going to tinker with something, I'll do a live stream anyway. And what, you know what's great about that? You could remember what you did. Right. <laughs> so there's a record of it somewhere. Right. Oh, I've used my own videos. So it's like, how oh, did sure. I do that? Because at the moment I'm done with the video, I'm as much of an expert as I'm going to be on that topic, and then it just degrades from there. So, um, Mike, uh, same question. Do you, uh, well, I do more live streams now than regular videos anymore, um, mainly because my work schedule is more amenable to that. But... Um, I, I like doing the live streams because it's more interactive. You know, I actually, people are actually there with me. And I, they, some of my viewers have actually told me, hey, do this or do that. It's like, crap, I, I would have remembered that 30 years ago, but <laughs> now I forget, you know? Right, right. And, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's nice. And it's like Steve said, it's something I can just, I can sit down, turn the computer on, and just go. You know, I don't have to sit there and do 50 takes or, you know, try to make sure everything's perfect. And, and then, you know, besides, if I don't live stream, my audience is going to revolt because they're not going to see Prada, my cat. Ah, <laughs> another, another show stealer. Every single live stream, and I have over 120 of them to date, every single one, the cat is on the desk. <laughs> he is more famous than I am, and nobody knows who I am. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had people walk up to me today, or yeah, yeah, today. I had, I had two people walk up to me today. It's like, did you bring Prada with you? I said, well, I would have, but Steve wouldn't let me. So, <laughs> right, right. rabbits and cats don't get along. They, they well, they do, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, cat saliva is toxic to rabbits. Oh, well. You learn something new every day? No, yeah, I just assumed cats were toxic, were, were deadly to rabbits. Oh, <laughs> you assumed it was the teeth, not the I used to have a python and a rabbit. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, I had to keep them separate. Ouch. So, Sean, exact same question, live versus, and, and, and lead into talking about interaction if you do live. Well, so I'm the opposite of all of the rest of you, so I cannot live stream, like, for the life of me, I, and I don't know how you guys do it. Like when I work on a computer, it's just me like silently doing it, right? So I've tried to live stream and I have to like catch myself. Like, oh, I haven't said anything in a while. <laughs> it's just That's probably real boring. Like Steve, you make things interesting the whole time. You're talking the whole time. I don't know how you do it. Like you did a live stream building shelves in your basement. You made that interesting. I don't know how you did that. I was a bit loopy by the end of it. Yeah, yeah. So the only times I've really live streamed are like as an experiment. Like I had a, a G5 uh, Power Mac. I had it running Linux, live streaming to Twitch with video and everything. Even that was a challenge. Like, all right, the big thing, I got this thing streaming to 
to Twitch, and now I gotta like say stuff while I'm doing it, or people are gonna leave. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so I'm you, almost all video. Almost all yeah. video. So, uh, David, do you uh, ever shoot live streams or interact directly no, with no. the customer? Yeah, no. customer. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I it's don't. a business. I generally don't make anything that I would personally find boring, and I'm not trying to be offensive here, but <laughs> I don't like watching live streams that other people it's do. It's certainly an acquired thing. And, and you know, to be honest, uh, you know, the it's like attention span has dropped dramatically. You know, we got TikTok now. It's like, you know, you watch 10 seconds of something and move on to another, right? So, you know, I don't want to go that extreme. But I want to cram as absolutely much stuff as I can in the 10 or 15 minutes that my videos right, can be right. because I want to keep people's attention span. When I look at my YouTube analytics, I want to see that retention all the way to right, the end right. of the video. And if I were to do a live stream, I'd have, you know, like a million people for like 30 seconds and then 500,000 for another 30 seconds. And by the time I got five minutes in, I'd probably have 12 people watching it. <laughs> and, you know, that's not good for subscribers either because they're not going to want to subscribe if, if they see that. So, yeah, I'm always trying to target the, the larger audience and, and I just don't think live streams... I mean, for some kinds of material, it works good, but for the kind of stuff I do, I just think it would be really boring like oh let me repair this computer by the way it's going to take four hours while we do this right. you know you want to watch no i don't think people are going to stick around for it hey so i'd I, be one of those 12. <laughs> <laughs> I, i've been surprised though because I, I when i started doing live streaming i did not expect anybody to watch any of it after it was live because same as you i'm like oh, this is boring you know there's no interaction here anymore but people i get con consistent emails and, and messages from people and going you know, I'll put you on during my work day and your, your background noise, or I'll put you on while I'm repairing something else. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I, I hope, like, it's not, like, annoying to you, like, you know, but <laughs> people have consistently said, like, they, they, it's like something to keep them company. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. I understand it's not for everyone because I certainly get the other side of the crowd where it's like, no. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you want to be my video production guy for free, you know, <laughs> go at it. <laughs> So it seems to me that um, when it comes to live streaming that there are, well, not live streaming, but there's two kinds of audiences. The ones that want that 15 minute, educate me, don't, don't lose my interest during this time. And then the people who, like I said, put it on in the background and, and just kind of gestate you know, while it's going on. Yeah, I think, I think also to David's point about attention span and everything, there was a, a YouTube survey or an Instagram survey or one of these that went out and it's like, what long, uh, short-term videos do you watch? And then it said, what long-form videos do you watch? And in parentheses, it said two to five minutes. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not long-form. That's what? <laughs> you know? Right. That's, you can't get a video across. And I'm, I mean, like, I've seen some great condensed videos, but, you know, the 10 to 15 to 20 minutes is usually what I think is, like, a sweet spot of you could dive in, you could talk a little bit about something, and, and you know, leave some for next time. Right. And, and that's kind of the rule at Hackaday was we said 10 minutes and I ended up like starting to push 20 and then 30. Um, yeah, and, and I lost crowd doing that, I, I think. But yeah, you, you, you want it to be the entire educational arc, but still be 10 minutes if you can, is, is kind of how we did it. So um, comments, do you interact with, with your? Yes. Yes? So and how does it go? No, surprisingly, especially like the, the vintage Mac community, and I apologize to the audio engineers and me holding the microphone at different speeds, you know, throughout the whole thing, at different lengths throughout the whole thing. Um, surprisingly, most of the people are genuinely interested. They want to help. Uh, they want you to try something. They want you to double check something. And very rare you get somebody who's just like, eh, you suck, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like, you know what? Watch somebody else. I really, right. let, you know, go ahead. There's plenty of awesome people out there. If, if I'm not your cup of tea, sure, that's fine. Um, but a lot of awesome things come through comments of like, hey, I, I was the engineer that worked on that project. I know that's happened to, to Sean a bunch of times. Or, hey, I have one of these that I'm trying to get working and you helped me fix it. Or, you know, oh, you missed that. I've, I've done this repair, you know, 50,000 times. There's this piece that's behind that piece that you have to do. So I think generally the community and the interaction is amazing. And whether it's a comment or a reply on social media or something like that, I think like that's where the community shines. Everyone wants to see something working. Right. And everyone wants to try and get there together. And so I think, like, generally speaking, especially in the vintage computing community, uh, that's been amazing. And I've been continually surprised of, like, how wide things reach, you know. Right. 
Right. David, same question. Do you interact with the the, the commenters and? Oh, phew. <laughs> that probably is. Talk yes. for a while about that. Yeah. Um, when you reach a certain size of a channel, um, math kind of plays into it. So, if you have a million subscribers, then it only takes like 0.001% of people to hate your guts for you to have a thousand people that hate your guts. Right. right? And those are going to be the most vocal people in the comment section. And for the longest time, I, for years, I just kind of had this policy of, you know, I, I like free speech. I'm not going to edit. I'm not going to, you know, um, you know, remove comments or whatever in the, in the comment section. But uh, I kind of changed my attitude on that um, a couple of years ago. Um, and what I did is I, one day I went in there and I banned about 200 people from my comment section. And okay. these, now these are people like, I don't mind if someone says, oh, David, you did this wrong or, you know, you could have done this better this way or whatever. But if their only comment is, again, David, you suck. Why don't you go jump in a creek? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> if that offers nothing useful to the conversation at all other than they just don't like me. I just ban that, per that person, right? Because, and when I did that, like, from that point on, it's like my comment section, just, just like this small little vocal crowd of people that hated my guts, it's like my comment section was cleaned up, like, dramatically. Like, <laughs> like and I, look, there's still negative comments in there, don't get me wrong, from people that said, oh, you did this wrong, or whatever. I'll leave those there, you know, like I said, I don't mind that, but, yeah, I, I've gotten to where I, I ban the, the, the haters. I just, right. you know. Because yeah, you're just, hanging it out there by you know, making a video in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I said, I still leave critical comments if, if they're useful or even, even if they're wrong, if they're useful, like if they're, they're, talk, they're talking about the subject material of the video, I leave it there. But yeah, if they're just jumping on there to say, David, you suck or whatever, then, then right. I, yeah, right. not delete them. Sean, do you, do you interact with? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I've had some of the most wonderful interactions in my comments. And I guess my channel's at like just the right size where I have enough reach that really interesting people have found my content. So as an example, uh, ages ago, I found this uh, compact Mac that was painted black and uh, had the CD-ROM drive hacked into it, and I bought it on a whim on Craigslist. I uh, brought it home, made a video about it. Uh, so the first thing that happened was somebody who sold it at a yard sale like in upstate New York saw the video and was like, oh my god, I had that in my house. <laughs> yeah. And then a little while later, I made a couple more videos on it. The person who originally painted the thing black found the videos. He said, I was trying to like stand out, be a hipster at my college. I brought it up there in like the early 2000s or something. And he was like, I was just watching YouTube one day and one, I literally like fell off my chair when I saw my old painted black Macintosh <laughs> recommended to me. <laughs> So, yeah, I've had a, a, a bunch of interactions like that with people who own the computer or own something very similar of a very rare thing, or even like engineers, people who worked at Apple have seen the videos and messaged me privately, like, oh, yeah, we made this decision because X, Y, Z, I was in the room when that happened. Right. But you so, cannot tell anybody about this. Yeah. And then, you know, people also, you know, help me fix things or give me recommendations. I really don't get a lot of negativity, which surprised me, actually. I'm still waiting on the, I'm oh, sorry, I'm still no, waiting no, on the, the, the Barbie cam people to find... <laughs> to find their video on, on YouTube. <laughs> they, they found it. They're just like, oh, I don't want to admit to that. <laughs> Do you think it's because you're kind of a niche market uh, with the, the heavy Mac crowd that they're not, they're, they're, they can find you when they're looking for you easier and they're nicer when they arrive? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I've done some videos that have gone out to a wider audience. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done a video that went like viral, but I have some with like way over 100,000 views. Those videos, sometimes I'll see comments in there that are, are negative or people who just, I guess their hobby is just write some like junk in a post and I'll just delete it, like whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I was just, I was shocked at how much positivity there is in like the vintage community and vintage right. Mac people, you're great, but all vintage, you know, retro computing is just such a positive community. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 very positive. Yeah, and and to you, uh... well, I'm so minuscule. You know, I, I'm still trying to figure out how I ended up up here because I only have like twelve or thirteen hundred subscribers. I I don't have 
I don't really have a lot of interaction, but I have one video that surprised me, and it's just me using my 1959 NCR cash register and actually like showing how it works. And it's one of my, it, I did it like four years ago in a, the darkest, dankest part of my garage at work. <laughs> and it's, it's like a horrible video. It's like the very first video I actually quote unquote edited. And I, I always get people say, oh my gosh, I used those things back in the 60s at this store and this store. And it's like, you know, and I had people tell me, oh yeah, the, you know, you, you get these keys and it does this. And so, oh, it's, it, and you learn so much. And in terms of like the, the community, like Sean said, I mean, people are typically helpful and, you know, I'm so small that I don't really have any trolls. You know, I've gotten like one or two, nothing serious. Right. You know, I mean, I, I get the typical, like, Steve, your video is too long. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, still, I still remember the guy who walked up to you and said, your videos are too long. No, no, they I, went I, up to Sean and complimented Sean. And yeah. then there was a slow pan to me and go, oh, your videos are too long. And it's, <laughs> it's a live stream. What it, yeah, it's, so. <laughs> was but, it weird that I, was, I agreed with him? I was like, yeah, I know, isn't it? <laughs> but I, 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 I want to interact with people as much as possible because I want them to know that I am paying attention. You know, it's like, right. you know, I do see what you're saying. So, I mean, even if I just put a like or, you know, you can leave the little heart thing, the, you know, <laughs> you know, Sean does it on my comments all the time when I say something snarky on his videos. Yeah, Mike was, <laughs> I banned Mike from my channel, all my troll posts were gone. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the thing, like, if, if you are willing to do, like, a live stream thing, you have to, like... I guess, figure out how responsive you're going to be for people or like, I've, I've seen some streams where it's like, yeah, the chat's on, the guy's like in the next room. There's not even a screen. He's just like hacking away at something. And it's like, hey, this is cool, but there's zero interaction. But you know, the people have conversations with themselves in the chat, which yeah. I guess works. It's just, you know, there's all these different, you know, the Twitch streams and, and YouTube and all this stuff where it's like, I guess each group has their own expectations of that interaction. So I think if you set that, you know, maybe the audience would be receptive, but hey, everyone's different, so. So I ended up doing live recently. I'm, I'm helping somebody get established in, in the live format, as we've said, who, we didn't have the time to do it. But, uh, or to do the editing, but what we liked about the live format is we interact with the chat. And we try and talk about real high level electronics sometimes where somebody can ask a question and says, well, why does the propagation occur that way? And then there's other times when somebody will say, well, Bill, that was stupid. Why, why did you do that? And, you know, and uh, yeah, I was in the room. I'm, I'm the stupid guy that made the decision. So. Um, do we have any questions from the field here? I'm going to start with me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Chris. I was going to say, David, you commented about live streaming, how it, you lose people's attention. I would largely agree with that. I think that the, the edited videos seem to be more appealing. However, I do want to say, Bill, yes. you pull it off. Every Friday, it's like you could talk for two hours, and it's good. Uh, we, one of our guys says that you know we could listen to you read the, the phone book, but anyway, uh, <laughs> read a data book. Um, but but yeah, excellent job on the streaming because it really is. I think um, it stands out oh, thank uh, among others. Um, and I was going to say, David, to what do you attribute your subscriber growth? Like over the period of your the time period of your channel, do you think? Um, uh, you know, compared with other channels, obviously, you know, million viewer, million subscribers is pretty big. Do you, do you think that there's a reason for that? <laughs> well, I think there's a few reasons for it. I don't know how long you have. Um, <laughs> so uh, part of it is just pure luck. Uh, I started at a time before there were very many retro YouTubers, and the barrier to entry was very low. And even that, and not only talking about the topic, but the quality, like of the production quality, the barrier to entry was very low. All you had to do, like when I started like 10 years ago, all you had to do was be better than 99% of the other YouTubers, which was easy to do because most YouTube videos back then were just junk. Okay, so that that was prob thing number one, just sheer luck. The time I started was just the perfect time. Uh, if I were to try to start today, especially with the same quality I had 10 years ago, yeah, yeah, I'd probably have about three subscribers. So I wouldn't give very far. So that, that's number one was luck. But also I've always uh, tried to keep a balance, like I said, about 
keeping the videos the right length so that they're very interesting until right up to the end. Um, I actually, when I'm editing the video, you know, because I may even have sometimes twice as much scripted as what ends up in the video because during the process of editing the video, I've got to watch it multiple, multiple times as I'm adding clips and changing things and rearranging things or whatever. If at some point I've watched this three times and said, you know, this part here is kind of boring, I just delete it. I just cut it out because I'm like, you know, that'll, that, that's a section people are going to probably hang up on the video, go watch something else, you know, switch channels, so to speak. You know, um, so I've always been very cognizant of trying to keep the the user retention, and I think that's 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 really important. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing is I try to strike a balance between complexity and uh, entertainment, you know, so to speak. Like a lot of people are always like, "Well, David, why didn't you go into the great detail of how this thing works in assembly or whatever?" And I'm like, "Well, because that would take an hour to explain." <laughs> Most people are not going to watch that, you know, and so I always I kind of use um, an imaginary 10 year old version of myself. So like if I could keep my 10 year old self understanding everything I've said, I think I'm at the right balance. If I say something that my 10 year old self would probably go, what are you talking about? Then I think I've made it too complex. And right. so um, I know some people complain and say, well, David, you could have explained to uh, you know, more detail on how that works. I'm like, yeah, but it's not necessary for 99% of the people watching this video. So that's kind of the balance I try to keep. Okay. Yeah. Where'd Chris go? I think I am about 10 years old, so that's, yeah. that's good. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hi. Hi, my question is for uh, Mike Stanhope. Hi, <laughs> Mike, this is Ron. Really? Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> I, 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 what I wanted to ask is recently on a stream you were talking about rebranding your channel, which is Mike's Mac Shack, because there's very few Macs in this shack. So have you thought <laughs> any more about what you might rename the channel, and are you accepting any sort of pitches for new names? Yes, I already have the channel name chosen. Are, are you going to drop it today for your loving fans? <laughs> My loving fans? You mean the 11 people that watch my live stream? What, what's the name, new name of your channel? It's going to be Mike's Mess. <laughs> because my house is an abs... Well, first of all, I don't live in a house. I live in a 650-square-foot, one-bedroom, second-floor apartment. And it's a disaster. There's right. computer crap. Obviously, I live alone. I am not married. So um, there is crap everywhere. My living room is not even a living room. It's just my computer storage center. area. So... I have one recliner, a TV I never use, my, my main Mac, my Mac Studio with all my screens and everything, and then I got my streaming desk. So I figured, you know what? A friend of mine over in Ohio came up with the name. It's like, you know what? That's perfect. So as soon as I get the art back for my channel, I'm going to change it because I've been working on a lot of PC stuff lately. So okay. I'll change the name of my channel too. So Yeah, I, I yeah I, be... I've subscribed to you when you were still the iBook guy. Yeah. I did not know that. You, yeah. you haven't always been the 8-bit guy. No. Yeah. Why Quit. 8? Well, go ahead. Well, I was going to oh. say, why 8-bit? That, well, that, so that I, had, magical. I had like, I don't know, over 100,000, I think, as the iBook guy. But I kind of run out of iBook-related stuff. <laughs> and I'd been looking for a new name for a while. And my brother actually suggested, well, why not call yourself the 8-bit guy? It's the same number of syllables, and it sounds really similar. Right. And I thought about it for a while. I'm like... Hey, that is a good name, you know, and it and it won't alienate so much my existing viewers because it, it is really similar. So that's right, right. that's how it ended up. Yeah. So Sean, how'd you come up with Action Retro? It just gained me. I don't know. I was just trying to well actually, so I was just thinking of random names and then I found that actionretro.com was open. I'm like, oh it sounds kind of good, Action Retro. So I eh. registered the domain, registered the YouTube channel. Cool. Just worked. Cool. <laughs> is directed to David, but the rest of the panel can answer if they want. What do you find, in regards to the Commander X-16, what parts of it do you think have over-exceeded your goals, like your initial goals for the project? The price. He's asking, what's too good about your computer? Exactly, <laughs> yes. So, um, I'm not, that, that question could be interpreted in a number of ways. I'm not really sure if you're asking, are you talking about like feature creep type things, or are you talking about like... Um, like he said, things that are way better than what I expected them to be. I'm not quite sure. Second part, like 
in parts, like, what do you find is a lot better than what you initially anticipated? Well, our video chip is way better because originally when, uh, you know, we decided, okay, we have no choice. we got to do an FPGA. You know, my requirements, I, I talked to a number of, of FPGA designers and said my requirements were pretty low. I mean, anything that was, like, as good as the C64 was good enough for me, right? I mean, and the guy that, that ended up designing our video chip, he started adding all this stuff, and I'm like, we're never going to use that. We're never going to use that. And then now here I am, like a lot of these games I've been writing, I'm using all that stuff that he put in there. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that he did do that, even though at the time I was like, <laughs> we didn't really need that. But, yeah, so, yeah, our video chip is uh, is pretty amazing. Cool. Good. Hey, uh, my question is uh, mainly for Sean. Uh, but, again, everybody else can answer. Um, Sean, I watch... Every one of your videos, uh, any, all of your shenanigans. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> Sorry and, to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and I have my favorite, um, one of your monstrosities, I guess you would call it, loving monstrosities, that is uh, one of my favorites. But I'd actually like to know what is your favorite one that you work on all the time? And I guess if you want to expand on that, what is everybody's favorite video that they've worked on? Oh, geez. Whichever one is in front of me at any given moment is my favorite. Now, I think right now the TAM is my favorite. Uh, just, be, you know, when I first got the TAM, I, I never like set out to find one. I just found it locally for sale and I couldn't pass it up. Uh, and I was just so surprised at how much I loved it, like the weird form factor, you know, the speakers, the subwoofer, which sounds amazing. And then, you know, after I recloth the, the speakers and I thought they look so good, and I put a different screen in there, just straight out of a power book. And it just, it was so sharp and clear. And uh, like just playing Wolfenstein 3D on it, it's, it's just like the perfect machine for it because it sounds so good, it looks so good, it runs so well. And yeah, I found a G4 upgrade for it, you know, a hack G4 upgrade for it. Uh, a BOS runs on it, it's pretty wild to run BOS on it. Uh, so yeah, that's my favorite at the moment. Nice, thanks. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I have a, a weird fascination with uh, Macintosh clones currently, so mm -hmm. I, I drool over some of Sean's machines, but yeah. uh, I actually picked up a, like a UMAX system from like one of these swap mates ages ago, and that sort of started me down that path of like, hey, what is this thing? Why did Apple do this? And so I, I started like a, a history series on that, and part two is in the works, but um, <laughs> just just one of those things where you go down a rabbit hole, and it's like, well, there, there are some videos that touch on bits and pieces of the history, but it's truncated into like three minutes, where it's like, oh, there's a story to be told there. You know, like, uh, you know, Michael Spindler trying to get Sun or IBM to buy the entire company so he could get a pay raise, you know. You know I'm summarizing a lot, but there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on in there that it's like, there's a reason this machine was sold for a period of time for this price, and I like diving into the history of that. So when Sean does videos on like the TAM or the clone or whatever, and he like just dives into stuff and just like, Oh, okay. I'll just use some B-roll that he already shot in my Steve, thing. I think I sent you B-roll for your part two in like 2020. Yeah, you had like, a different haircut. I lived haircut, in a different house a when I sent you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's fine. We'll just we'll just like AI your face so you, you look younger. Okay. Question, question for David, but also to the greater panel as well. You did have one side project that was really interesting. You had a podcast that you were part of. Is there plans to continue that? I thought that was really entertaining. And to the other guys, have you ever thought about starting up any kind of podcasting, or is the live streaming pretty much your version of it? Thanks. So I assume you're referring to the Geek Bits podcast I did with my brother and, and a friend. So um, the problem with that is uh, my brother decided... Uh, to start an arcade, which actually I'm part of as well, although he's probably a bigger part of. He's been working way more on it than me because I don't have that much time. But so he had this nice big shop that he had, that he had bought that he was doing all this stuff in, and then he decided he wanted to start the arcade. So he started buying all these ar arcade machines, and pretty long, you know, you, you repair an arcade machine, now you got to put it aside because we don't have a, a location to open an arcade yet. So his building started just filling up with arcades. And the room that we used to dedicate to the podcast, there's now like 12 arcade machines crammed in there. So there's no place to do the podcast anymore. <laughs> so um, as soon as we open an arcade location and move all that stuff out, we'll probably do more Geek Bits podcasts. But yeah, anyway, that's, that's the reason why there haven't been any. Yeah, I, I've thought of doing a podcast before, but... 
just try with a day job and trying to get the regular videos out. It's just I don't think I have enough time to do something like that well. Yeah, I, th I think almost like the live stream is almost like a type of a podcast. I mean, I see a lot of people like the retro Maccast guys have been doing it for a while. Where mm -hmm. we'll, they'll use uh, something like Streamyard, and they'll stream to YouTube like the the quick and dirty version of it, and then they'll clean up the audio afterwards and actually release it through normal channels and stuff like that. And there's like MacEck and the Retro Repair Roundup, and and we we've, we've been guests on some of those and stuff like that. And and it, it's you know there's like this weird thing where it's like oh well you could do podcasts, you also do video podcasts, and it's like oh, well, isn't that just streaming or making a video? So there's like a, a crossover there that I think that, you know, comes back to just like how much time do you have and what are you willing to put into it? And, and are, are there going to be topics that you could talk about like weekly or biweekly or whatever? Cool. Yes. Uh, this is a quick question for David, the 8-bit guy. Um, is Dimebag Dill really your cousin? Because <laughs> I can't believe it. How? Yeah, well, was my cousin, I guess. Yes, yes. That's uh, that amazing. Is, that is uh, hi, I'm a Pantera fan, and now I'm uh, very interested. I don't really talk about it that much because, to be honest, I, um, I'm not a fan of their music. Okay, I'm, you know, no offense. I just not, that's not the style of music I like. And so, um, not only that, they, they never, didn't really come around family events very often. Um, so, you know, I could probably count on both hands the number of times I actually talked to Daryl and probably on one hand the number of times I talked to Venny. So, I mean, it's not something I think about a whole lot, um, but um, yes, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, quick question. Um, for, uh, for those of you who, have, uh, who make videos but also have a part-time or a full-time job, a full-time day job, but then have transitioned into just making videos, how has that affected your video making process and like, would, do, do you, is it easier, harder, in what ways is it, is it different? I may be the only one that yeah, applies. I'm going to say we all have jobs besides yeah. you. <laughs> um, when I quit my job, it was extraordinarily scary, and I remember, and I will never forget the day I walked out of my job for the last day to the parking lot. I'd worked there 11 years, and I'm like, I hope this works out because, uh, you know, I'm going to have to find another job if it doesn't. I worked myself to death the first four or five months uh, because I was afraid, like, I wanted to make sure I, you know, I spent out like six videos a, a month back then um, because, you know, I was working 20 hours a day or something like that sometimes because I was a deadly, deathly afraid I wasn't going to make enough money to, to survive. But uh, actually, once I quit my uh, day, because I was only making like one or two videos a month when I was working the day job, I r eventually realized that, okay, you know what, um, I'm making like three, four videos a month is, is plenty to, to, to survive by. So, uh, you know, I... I I scaled back a little bit, but yeah, I I, uh, I just I was really afraid of uh, for a while of, of not being able to make ends meet, but uh, that ended up being not a, not as much of a concern. Um, my Patreon grew really quickly at that point, and uh, and and whatnot, and I don't know. And of course, now I'm back to making you know two videos a month, but that's mostly because I've uh, I've got all these other projects going now, like the Commander X16 and game development and all that, which steals time away from me be able to make develop or make videos but uh anyway i hope that answered your question <laughs> well i'll ask the, everybody else has anybody thought about going uh full-time video or or is this the thing you is this its own ends ends to a means or means to an end is what i mean i mean it, it it's a scary thought for sure like i i would be afraid of that i mean it, it it's interesting i never expected my youtube channel to be successful so i never <laughs> thought about that, you know, being in the realm of possibility. On the flip side, I really love my day job and I think I'm pretty good at it. And it's very flexible. Like I, you know, even before the pandemic, we had hybrid in office and work from home, which was very helpful to starting the channel. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I work a lot by deadline. So as long as I get things for the day job done by a certain date, I'm good. So I can, you know, it's not so much I'm, I'm doing a widget for eight hours or something, you know? So right, right. I think I have a pretty good balance right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's certainly something that you think of like, oh, that'll be great. 
<laughs> and then like <laughs> the horror settles in of like, oh no, what did I get myself yeah. into? Um, and I mean, because I don't know, probably like a lot of you folks, if if I'm working on something and it's not working, like, oh, it's 4 a.m. now and I'm still <laughs> hacking away at this thing, you know, like not good for my health probably to, to do that, you know, and I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I would like to just mention you know, one of the things that I'm jealous about for people who have normal jobs is they work their eight hours or whatever, and then they go home and they don't think about their job again until the next day. And so they can go out and do all kinds of things. And, and well, it's nice that, yeah, I, I can make my own schedule because I'm self-employed, so I don't need to ask the boss to, you know, for a doctor's appointment or, you know, take my kid to something or whatever. But yeah, that's nice. But I work way harder now and way more hours now than I ever worked when I worked for the man, so to speak. Right. And so <laughs> um, it's, um, you know, there's pros and cons to, to doing YouTube full time. Well, well, I think especially in the vintage community of, of these computers that we all play around with, there are so many variables that you could have a new in-box system, you could have the right software, the right cable, the right adapter, the right mindset, the right knowledge, and every single thing will break and go wrong. I don't and know what you're talking about. Everything I do works first try. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's like, so many times I will plan out something. I'm like, oh, this will be great. I'll get it with this schedule and get this done. And it's just like, yeah, no, nothing wants to work. You know? I know exactly what you're talking about. I deal with that almost every video. I mean, just great example. Uh, recently I was filming something and I was using my Commodore 1084 monitor. And it's decided to quit working on me. Like, it just goes black. And I could tap the side of it, it come back on for a bit, for about 30 seconds and go black again. And of course, I'm sure I can repair it. It's probably a bad solder joint or something, but that's, I don't have time for that right, right. now. I'm trying to finish this video. Right. So like during the whole course of the video, I'm like re-filming scenes constantly. I'm like filming, type, 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 type. Oh, it died again. <laughs> Let me reset the camera. Bang on the side of the monitor a little bit. Oh, it's working again. All right, film, 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 quick, quick, quick. You know, I and mean, that's not the subject of the video. It's not a repair video about this. I'm trying to show something else, you know. That kind of thing happens all the time. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think there's just a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, obviously, your normal viewer does not expect. You know, they, they think, oh, you have someone doing a film crew and this and that. It's like, no, I asked my wife to hold the camera as I, you know, <laughs> use the tripod for something else or whatever, you know. Or throw a box at your head. Yeah, oh, cool. <laughs> No, let's not hey, revisit at, that. At least your wife helps you. I'm still trying to get my cats to do something. No, they knock over stuff for you. <laughs> well, yeah, they're very good at that. But They give you more things to fix. That's, this is very true. But I think, you know, like like struggling to fix something or, or it's breaking or all this stuff, it's like I do a lot of posts to like Patreon or like behind the scenes stuff on Discord or whatever to let people know like what I'm working on just to sort of give them a sense of like, hey, here's what I'm putting into it. Um, and I think... You know, there's there's a, a nice thing of like, hey, here's the behind the scenes stuff, and some people love that. Some people could not care less. Like, oh, here's five bucks, like a month, like it, you deserve it. Like, go do whatever. But some people like, I'm giving you a dollar. I want to see every single shot that you did. I want to know why you did that. I want to have a Q and A with you afterwards. And it's like, whoa, you know, it's like, here's your dollar back, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I've actually done that. I've I've had some. Patreon, not very many, but a few who were extremely demanding. They were like giving me one dollar a month, and then they were like literally demanding, like, you know, hey, I'm paying you, and I want you to do it this way or that way. And I finally just told them, dude, I, I don't, I don't need your money. Yeah. Going. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Mike. I would, I would like to say thank you for your coverage of this event last year, because any exposure we can get, we really appreciate. Oh, yeah. and it was, it was very nice coverage you did, David. Was it worth it? You're going from your nine to five to all this grueling work. Is it worth it? You're not talking about VCF. You're talking about going full time as a YouTuber. Yeah, I'm sorry. Separate <laughs> question. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, actually, answer um, that question too. Yeah, I, I think it was worth it. At least for me, uh, I'm not sure it's worth it for everyone, but yeah, I, I think so, because I feel like I'm accomplishing something that's going to be remembered. Where if I worked a nine to five job every day, nobody's gonna remember what I did there. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, I think that's what's so tantalizing about, you know, oh, I could do this full time. I could, I could do focus more on this and that. And I, th I think it, everyone has to sort of make that decision of if it's right for them. But like you said, you can't turn off at the end of the day. You're, you go. There's that room in, in your house where it's like, oh no, that's where all the projects are. And oh, I'll just sit down for a moment and oh, it's five a.m. You know. <laughs> 
might seem like a really simple, simple question, but I've been <laughs> dying to know. Like, when you're doing a software project, or like the floppy rate, or installing Linux or something, is there like a method to the madness of choosing a computer? Or is it, is it like, oh, here's one out of the bin, I'm gonna pull it out, here's a, I don't know. I mean, I, when I get an idea like that, like the floppy raid, for example, it, like the whole thing, I mean, it's ridiculous, yeah. But the whole thing just kind of pops into my head, like, oh, I should do it on that computer, and that would be really funny. Um, sometimes it's like, okay, which computer would run Linux well enough to do something like that, where I could, you know, because the floppy raid, you know, that wound up going front page on Hacker News to a website that I had hosted on floppy disks that were raided together. <laughs> So I'm glad that I picked a more powerful Power Mac to host it on. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say that Sean is very jealous of the Jazz Raid that I picked up at the swap meet uh, last time. And I am uh, jealous. <laughs> you, you, could you have any Jazz drives to spare? They don't work. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried zip disks? They're more reliable. Eep. <laughs> click, 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 click. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, this question applies. This question applies to everybody who does scripted videos. Bill asked about the hours invested to minutes of produced video, but what are the splits, pre-production, filming, post-production? How much, how much is the ratio on those? Mm. I'll start just from the Hackaday videos I did. I would have two or three projects going at once, and I'm doing PC boards a month out that I'll need you know, in, in a month. And so in that case, uh, a good half, 50% was all the stuff I needed just before I could turn on the camera. And then, you know, with editing and all that, you, there goes the other 40%. Actually, only 10% is actually standing up in front of the camera and doing the stuff the actual time the camera's running. You know, I'm, I'm then running around resetting lights or, or something like that. How about, how about you guys? Yeah, I think that... that it really depends on the project. Like it, it could, one, you, I, I know everything about this already. I don't have to research too much. So I'll just go ahead and, and write a script and film it or whatever. And some, you start out with an idea and you start tinkering with it or you start filming it and go, oh, this is going a different way or I have to cover something else or I don't know where I am. I have to do some more research. I have to reshoot the intro or whatever. I mean, it just might be me not being as organized as some other folks, but sometimes I'll write a script and it's like, nope, I'll shoot that shot for shot, like I did a Mac clone series, and that was very heavily researched because I wanted to get the facts right and everything. And I still flubbed the line, but whatever. Um, but you know, just depending on the subject, you know, sometimes I could just spend, you know, almost equal amount of times, you know, writing, filming, editing, and go from there. But other times it's like, oh, I have to, I have to rewrite this script because I made a bunch of assumptions and I was wrong because I'm human, you know, and I have to go from there. So for me, it depends on the kind of video that I'm making. If it's like a restoration video, I usually don't start with a script on those because I don't know what's going to happen. And so what I'll do is I'll film the project. That's going to take days, maybe weeks. And, um, and then after I've got all the video clips, I'll look through them, and then I write the script based on what I filmed, and then I edit. Um, the editing, a lot of people think that's the, the like big time sink, and it's really not. I mean, I'd say that's like 5%, 10% of video production time. Most of it for me is either scripting or filming, depending on what kind of video. If it's a documentary, I'm going to spend a ton of time scripting, a ton of time going out there um, on forums, asking questions, you know, despite the fact that, you know, some of my haters always say, David never researches anything. No, <laughs> David goes out on all these forums and asks questions uh, months ahead of time before these videos are made, like, you know, how did this work? Who did that? You know, and sometimes the answers are wrong, but, you know, that's what I... You know, it's the best I can find sometimes. So yeah, sometimes the scripting is like 90% of the work and sometimes it's 10%. It just really depends on the kind of video I'm making. Now, I'm not the most organized person in the world, uh, so I have a hard time estimating the split, you know, because uh, sometimes I'll have an idea and, and I do script the first half of every video, at least the first half. So sometimes I'll just write the whole script in one go and it just worked and then I'll pop in some research, but other times I'll write like an intro and I'll be like, oh, I don't know what else to put. And then I'm working on 10 other different things. So uh, yeah, it's really hard to estimate, but I, I do put a lot of work in before the video. And probably if I was more organized, it would be a better, a better split that made more sense. Right now I probably spend way too much time on the preparation just from procrastination. <laughs> 
See, my favorite part is the editing part, and I, I love sitting there and playing with Final Cut Pro and just, just experimenting. Because I, I, don't, I, I don't know anything about the software. I've only started using it a couple years ago. So I spend more time with the, the editing part. I mean, I, I just do a lackluster video, and, you know, this is my hobby. It's not my job. So, you know, I'm not really too concerned with how many subscribers I have. Or, so I try to make them look as polished as I can and, you know, Try to make them look nice. So I spend, you know, probably about thirty or forty percent of the time doing the editing part. How how much yeah. time, or do you have a fear, and this is for everybody, of keeping stuff fresh? It it it, it got hard for me to find topics when I was doing Hackaday videos. Mm. Well, Sean will come over to my basement, or Mike will come over to my basement, and they'll I'm just gonna, I'm, yeah, take I'm, something off the shelf. I'm going to say, yeah. if, if I ever run out of anything to to fix, I have. 2,000 square feet in New Jersey I can pick and choose from. Um, I just have to, wait for, I have to wait for him to, to leave and his <laughs> wife is there because if his wife's there, I can take anything I want. <laughs> if Steve is there, it's, it's, he will pick and choose what he gives me because he still, <laughs> he still will not give me the Quad G5 or the Apple III. The Sorry. Hoser. For me, it's not so much about what I can make a video about, because I have endless topics. The problem is always, what can I make a video about with what I currently have, right? Because I have, I, I almost look at it sometimes like what you'd call dependency hell in Linux, like, you know, back in the older days, you want to install this, and it says, oh, you can't install that until you got this. Oh, so you install that, oh no, you can't install that until you got this, and you go down the line until you finally find the thing that you, to, to, so you can install all the rest of it. That's, That's kind of ham with my video projects because I'll have a list of projects I want to make, and I'm like, well, I can't make that one until I finish this because I need the part for that and this, and and, and it just is like this huge de circular dependency thing, and so I'm always just like, what can I make today? What can I move to the front burner? But as far as having ideas, oh no, I get millions, millions of ideas. Well, yeah, I, I think the ideas and the, the interest we we all have interest in different segments of vintage computers and stuff like that. So I think the, the ideas or the sparks of something to play around with are always there. But uh, for me, sometimes it's like, oh, I want to do this, and I go to play around with that computer. Oh, the power supply is bad. Oh, the floppy drive is bad. Well, how do I fix that? Well, that's maybe a, a stream or something like that or whatever. You know, and uh, you're never going to run out of that curiosity. I think that's great. But um, I, I think that there's probably like a limited... Uh, interest in certain things that we might find fascinating and it's, others are like yeah, no so I'd like to tie this question back to one of the themes of VCF this year which is keeping retro computers going and old computers going I think we live in a really interesting time where people are able to make a lot of new things for old computers uh, DOS dude one is here he made an IDE SSD that just works amazing I have it on my G4 cube now but like with cheap PCB fabrication houses and stuff and people building open source stuff and it's so easy to go from idea to, to build something. Uh, they're, they're, I don't think there's any end to the kind of creativity that can go into building and modifying and having fun with, I mean, you build a whole new com retro computer. I mean, it's, it's, from that perspective. I think a new kind of retro computer, yeah. I'm, I'm digesting You build a new old retro computer well it's just the same as new old stock you know <laughs> well I, I think it it also uh you know breathes such new life into the community because there used to be so many steps like let, let's say an old mac you know you, you'd have to be like, all right well you need a scuzzy hard drive you need an adb keyboard you need this you need that now it's like oh well you get, just get a blue scuzzy or oh you, there's they make adb to ps2 or usb adapters and it's like you know, 15 years ago, there wasn't these things. So it's like, oh, I got to buy these old SCSI hard drives that have been sitting in a server for 24 years, and it will work for a day, you know, and then you're off to eBay again, you know. So I, I think also it also helps with um, a lot of these hard-to-find parts or these chips that are no longer manufactured, and there are a lot of awesome, smart people. And so any one advice I would give to anybody who's, like, tinkering around with this stuff, spread your net wide and get involved in like a community there's like tinker different or all these other forms and stuff like that and just like say hey I, i'm interested in this here's what i could provide or here's what i want and you know the vcf forum is great for that and these talks are great for that because there's going to be people who have different skill sets that you know i i could barely read a schematic 
And I know smart people are like, oh yeah, that's, you know, Apple has this chip and it's labeled that. That's actually a such and such with this thing. And you could just get this off the shelf art. And I'm like, oh, you know, so it's like, get, get your, the strengths from your, your friends and, and build these great things. And I think it's just going to serve the community tenfold. So you have a question over here? Uh, I have a question for all of you in general. Um, how do you manage to store all these computers in your house? <laughs> And let's say you live with somebody else, right? How do you diffuse a situation where it's like you bring a computer home, right? And the other person goes, why the hell are you bringing this home? You already have a million other computers at home. Come on, man. I would like to sincerely apologize have, to my wife. I have three storage units. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, used to have Chris. a one-bedroom apartment, which I shared with my very patient wife, and uh, the closet you could not open because things would fall out. Um, and I had a storage unit and whatever, and uh, thankfully my parents were very patient. I used their garage and all that stuff. But, um, you know, it, it's a slippery slope because once you put things into storage, it's like, are you actually using them? And, right. or, you know, it's, it's, you know, oh, I'll just store this at a friend's house and this and that and all that stuff. And so I, I think you sort of have to pick and choose like what you really think are important. And yes, I know I'm being a hypocrite, Sean. Yeah. Quiet. Um, but you know, I, I had I have a basement, so I built shelving to try and store these things in an organized way. Uh, I'm going through. I think one of the most important things is to have an inventory of what you have. So I'm trying to do that using a like an app that makes it a little bit easier to like document things. So it's like, oh, I have seven 6100 Power Max. I don't need an eighth. Oh, this guy needs one. There you go. You know, just trying to settle things and, and not, um, we're all interested in different things, but it's like, okay, maybe, maybe I should not get into the Commodore stuff before I, I finish this. You know, I think there's, there's some method to the madness because you could easily go overboard. Ask me how. Yeah, it's something that I, I struggle with a little bit. I used to live in like the tiniest row house in, in the middle of Philadelphia, man, trying to cram old computers in there. And, you know, again, very patient wife of mine. Uh, was very supportive of me doing this stuff. Uh, so thank you. Um, <laughs> she might be watching. Uh, but yeah, so fortunately now we moved into a house that actually has a reasonable basement. And, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, a lot of my videos are one computer for multiple videos where I'm doing lots of different upgrades. So, you know, I don't have six of the same computer generally. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it is a struggle that I do want to get better with. Yeah. Well, I can speak to this question a little bit. Um, I, uh, I got to a point where I started accepting these donations. People were sending me stuff like crazy, and a lot of this stuff was, you know, expensive stuff. I mean, I had people just sending me, like, you know, Amigas and Commodores and Apples and all this stuff, and how am I going to turn this down? I mean, people are going to offer, offer this stuff for me for free, and then, you know, my house got kind of full. And then, um, yeah, at some point or another, I realized... You know, because I, I wanted to accept everything because I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm going to need this for a future video or something, you know? And then, um, yeah, the house got to where you could hardly walk in there anymore. Of course, I live with, you know, I have family members, so that, that wasn't working out very well. And, um, yeah, one day I just said, you know what? I got to, first of all, I got to stop the donations. So I, I quit taking any donations. Um, and, you know, I got some flack for, for that, like, you know, my, I gotta always talk about my haters. So my haters are like, "Oh, poor ape, uh, people are sending him free stuff, and you just know what to do with it." You know, but they didn't really see like the problem it was creating. And I, I, I like to an analogy. It's like, what if your neighbor brings you a pie they made, and you gotta go in your fridge? You're like, well, that's very nice, thank you. And then another one, and then another one, and then another one. The next thing you know, your fridge is full, and your neighbors keep bringing you these pies and cakes and stuff they're making. What are you gonna do with them? Eventually, you gotta say no. I can't take this anymore. I appreciate it, but no, I just have nowhere to put it. So that that was the first thing I had to do was just stop taking the donations. But then I still had a problem if I had too much stuff, and I just had to start purging some of it. Um, we have a very vibrant community in DFW. In fact, I've seen like four or five people here today from DFW. I see one of them right there. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I just started giving it away, like tons of stuff. Just you know, I'd post like on our group, like, hey, does anybody want this stuff? And I just had people coming to my house and picking it up. And I, I remember one guy, like, uh, I gave him all my TRS-80 stuff. He brought, like, a big van over, and I literally just filled the whole thing up <laughs> with it. But 
I've got this great strategy that's actually working out really well. And I know this sounds funny. It's not meant to be funny. But the way I'm storing stuff now is by giving it to other people, and then I borrow it back from them <laughs> when I need it for a video. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I don't, yeah. that th that's, that's the way I'm doing it. <laughs> it's amazing how well that works, because yeah. Steve will tell you, I, I, I have given him so much stuff over the years, and then a year later of the... Hey, Steve, I need that thing I gave you like a year ago that I can guarantee you're never going to be able to find. But he does actually find it, and, you know, so. Cool. Cool. Question in the back. So, um, so the question, so, so I have a question for, well, I actually have two questions for the 8-bit guy. So the first one is, yeah, so that's that's Dave. So the question is, so question one, what, what, why are you, why have you come all the way up here from Texas to go to uh, to New Jersey to go to VCF East? Because I think you would normally you would go to like was it like VCF Midwest or something? A different one. Actually, I, I go to conventions all over the place. I, oh. I've I've been to conventions in practically every state, even other countries, Europe, whatnot. Um, I mean, I, I try to schedule four or five a year. It's not always the same place. Um, sometimes people are ac actively reaching out and inviting me, like, hey, David, you want to come to our, which is what happened this time. Right. Jeff, Jeffrey, I was going to say, David's here because we asked him. Yeah. Jeff, and he said yes. Jeffrey Brace asked, asked me to come here, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, that's just how that works. Um, so... Uh, the other question I had uh, regarding the Commander X-16, and I know how this is like something that you're, that like you have to build from scratch and you're eventually going to be selling. So speaking of the building from scratch part, I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering about its like environmental impact. Like more specifically, like are you able, are you able to ensure that like uh, the, uh, like all, like the whole supply chain in the production process has like net zero carbon emissions basically? Or is that even important Like, because that's you? ideal. Uh, let's just say the thought hadn't even crossed my mind. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a better answer for you on that. Yeah. So okay. I mean, it's not like we're making millions of these, so I don't I don't think that it's going to make much. They're not made of styrofoam either, so. <laughs> bing bing bang boom. Okay. So. Um, Actually, I have, this is an apropos to a question that was posed a few questions back here about new things for retro machines. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I work on FujiNet, but I wanted to make an announcement to the panel here because we have an inordinate exponent of Mac users up here. <laughs> um, one of the, we just started to bring up this weekend for what will be the Apple Macintosh version of FujiNet for a very specific reason. And that is you have the 128K and the 512K Macs and the pluses that are extremely resource constrained. The FujiNet for these devices will plug into the floppy port and offer for the first time a usable network adapter for these machines. Woo, that's pretty cool. Thank you for that, for somebody who uh, yep. cut his teeth using a 512K. <laughs> so, when can I buy one? <laughs> yeah, me too. We've just started to bring up today. So, so uh, we talked to somebody mentioned Patreon earlier and also Discord. I was going to ask, how much uh, off channel support do you guys do? Do you totally engage your audience or partially or not at all? Or Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. That's something I'm trying to be better at. Uh, I have a wonderful community on Patreon. Uh, you know, not, not only do they support financially, but also they give me information, they help me with things, and it's really amazing. So that's actually where I'm trying to put more focus is to creating content for them and especially, you know, engaging with them because they can be such a great resource. Right. You know, because they're the people who are really most engaged with the content, they, they really enjoy the content, they know a lot about it, so yeah, Patreon's been pretty good. Patreon, yeah. yeah. Anybody else use, some, you, you have Patreon. Yeah, uh, that actually probably accounts for about a third of maybe okay. almost half of my income. And so uh, it's pretty important. I, um, I post like, you know, extra little content for them, 
you know, like little updates and stuff uh, every every couple of months. And um, I also let them view the videos early before they go live on YouTube. I also use them a little bit for uh, like almost like beta testers for the video. Right. Because right. like if I said something wrong in the video, they're going to tell mm -hmm. me before I release it to YouTube so I can go fix it. Um, so yeah, for by the way, every time I release something on YouTube that has a, a mistake in it that people call me out on, like you know, a few thousand people already watched it and they didn't catch it either, <laughs> you know, uh, before, you know, before it goes out there. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, and I always, of course, anybody on Patreon that sends me a, an email, I try to respond uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, a great testing ground for content. Yeah. Um, and, and we all make mistakes and, and people who watch videos might me think, oh, the, he knows what he's talking about, so this is like, I'm going to take this verbatim, but it's like, you know, we might be remembering something differently. You know, it's, hey, it's been 20 years since I powered this thing on. I think it works this way. Oops, you know, you you have the hindsight of looking at the manual while you're watching the video, you know, so. Um, but I, I try and interact with, uh, whether it's on uh, YouTube's uh, uh, membership thing or via Patreon, uh, you know, I, I don't have the, the luxury with time usually to post, uh, just how I work usually, to post like a full, finished version of the video before it goes public. So what I usually do is I'll post like a draft version. And it's like, okay. hey, this has extra content. Maybe the audio isn't perfect. Maybe the diagrams aren't there. But it's like, well, here, here's what I could give you because I've worked myself silly trying to like make that deadline. And usually it's like, well, look, I'm, I'm burning myself out. This is not fun for me. So I had to adjust it for myself. But my, my, the, my supporters and, and my fans and everything are like, yeah, you do you. And it's like not going to work for everybody, but like right. that for my specific audience is like I try and respond when I can. Uh, there's a Discord channel. I try and like do some like rough troubleshooting with some people, you know, and, and just try and support the community because they supported me. You know, right. when I ask right. questions, people usually respond. So I, I want to try and give some of that back, you know, just to whatever little bit I have, you know. So you have Discord. Then. Yeah, I have a very. Small you guys have Discord or participate in Discord? No. Anybody participate? I'm not so good with like live chatting. Okay. Know, so I prefer asynchronous communication. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so, I'm very antisocial, so you know. Well, you have. Now, if we had an antisocial network, I mean, I'd be all over that. So. But, you know. I, yeah, I, I think it's even easy to get overwhelmed with like a bunch of every social media flavor of the month, and you know, like people contacting you through all different sides, and like, oh, did you get that email I sent you? Wait. Who are you? Oh, your username and your icon changed last week, but you assumed that I remembered. Mm. I have a memory of a goldfish. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> I'm always having people ask me why I don't have Twitter, why I don't have Instagram, why I don't have you know all these different things, Discord and all that. It's like I cannot keep up with all of it. Right. Yeah. You know, I I just I'm only one person. You know? <laughs> so VCF has a Discord. Just to let everybody know, Woo! if you didn't know, I hang out on it, so it's a. And I'm also, we do have a Discord for Coriolis Dash Effect if you want to hear me talk in, in after hours and stuff. So we have a question? Uh, hi, this is a, a question for the, the whole group. Uh, I'm curious as to what your opinions are on the collection of specifically retro keyboards and uh, adapting them to work with modern computers and separating them from the retro computers. Do you think it, uh, it will carry on the legacy of retro computers further than uh, they would if they were stuck to broken machines? I, I think it's evil. <laughs> uh, I usually like to use the keyboards that go with the computer they were designed yeah. for. I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh. go ahead. No, I, I think, I think like, yeah, it's great to use the original keyboard, but um, a lot of people will like toss the accessory or the part and you know, you'll get, just get like a Mac 512 without the keyboard and thankfully they're like modern adapters and which is great, you know, you could use the machine. But like, I, I've seen people like take like a new in box, like whatever, and they'll be like, oh, that's an Apple II, but the keycaps are great. So I'm gonna take the keycaps off. Oh yeah, you wasted the rest. It's like, oh no, like mm. there's somebody who would use that. Like, I, I think as long as like, you know, you're, it's already dead, <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. I, I'm I'm trying to save everything, and, and I have a weird sickness with that. But I think like to an extent, like yeah, sure, it's your machine. You could do whatever you want with it. But like, don't like just like rip off something that's brand new and then throw the rest of the parts away. Because like, there are some people that like, oh, that chip wasn't made like for very long, and that could really be used in something else. Or people just want parts, you know. So some of these keyboards are worth more than the computers they go to yeah. now. 
Commodore 128D, for example, there are half of them are missing keyboards. So, oh, yeah. And then the Mac Pluses and stuff, you can't, like, the keyboards are worth Certainly. twice what the machines were. The original C128D had a, it, it was supposed to clip up because we were afraid of that. And of course, the metal one comes along that I didn't know anything about, and, and, and those are the missing keyboards, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. The so, keyboard cable for the. SX64. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's worth, yeah. worth more than 64. So I'll tell a, real quick a, uh, a keyboard horror story uh, why you don't want to know what my basement looks like. I have <laughs> prototypes and, and one-of-a-kind stuff. And the other day, one of my clocks fell off of something, and it lands on this C16 that was used for FCC testing, and a keycap goes flying <laughs> off. And I just pictured you guys going like this. <laughs> So, and, and one time I was here, I was throwing the prototypes around, and everybody, stop handling your own stuff. <laughs> so, go ahead. Okay, yes. Uh, oh, there we go. A question for the panel with, um, you know, this with streaming getting more popular and YouTube getting more popular. Uh, do you find that this is becoming competitive at any level, either for viewership or maybe you want to beat somebody to the punch on a particular uh, subject matter? You know, even something as niche as uh, retro computing, it seems to be more and more streamers uh, coming, coming out. So, Steve and I both stream, so um, we try not to, we, we, Steve and I are best friends, by the way. Um, and we, we, we try to work with each cat. other. And, you know, we, we, we've done several streams together, you know, um, like at least 10, if not more. But there are a lot of people who are streaming now, especially in this community, and I might sit down, I decide, I say, okay, I want to stream, and there might be five people I know in the community streaming already. It's like, well, nobody's going to watch if I do anything. I mean, I've actually done videos where nobody has watched, and I'm just like, okay, fine, nobody's watching, I'm just going to hang up, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's getting harder to find times when you can stream and, of course, since I have a full-time job, I can't just wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and stream for everybody in Australia and Europe. Wish I could, but, you know, they would love it. I think the video is not, like, a, so much a competition, but, you know, the, I think the audience itself is growing. And I love being able to uh, point people to, you know, videos that are really interesting or other YouTubers that are doing really interesting things. And I feel like... A YouTuber might be an entry point, or a certain video might be an entry point, and that YouTuber can then, you know, point people in the direction of other content. And I, I really try to link out to other videos within my videos that are related or give deeper information. Uh, you know, I use YouTube's card feature for that. So I don't think the videos are competitive from that perspective, even you know, being the first to like cover something. You know, I'd rather be the third, fourth to cover something and then be able to point people to the people that came before me covering specific aspects of whatever that was. And it's kind of like a whole little, you know, cadre of people covering the same topic I think is a great thing. I don't normally think of myself as competing with other YouTubers except in one aspect. And I've mentioned this a little bit in a video which has to do with restorations. Because I feel like the last few years, we've gotten to where different YouTubers, I feel like they're trying to compete, like who can restore the most destroyed computer, you know, and make it look new again. And that's not a competition I really want to be in. Um, I still do. I mean, I already get accused of, like, faking videos. Like, I don't know if any of y'all saw the roadkill Nintendo that I, you know, like, I had, like, a thousand people say that I faked that, like, I staged that or whatever. Thomas can vouch for me. He's from my area. He knows that that was is exactly the it unfolded exactly the way I said that it did. But again, the more you get into that kind of thing, the more it would encourage other people to fake stuff, and then more people are going to accuse me of faking it. And uh, I've even been accused of destroying computers so that I can repair them, <laughs> as well as staging them in places like that. So that's one kind of competition I've been trying to avoid because I just don't want to. I don't want to get into that. But that's, that's the only thing I can really think of where there would be. Isn't the competition with the algorithm of Google just to like cut through the noise? It, e even if there's a, a small class of people looking for you, it doesn't seem easy to find you. You know, unless you meet some of the criteria, which you do, 
and you don't, and I don't, you know. Uh, so it's, isn't that the competition though, is trying to re abide by the YouTube rules? No, mm -hmm. just you make the video the way you make the video, and does how about you guys? Do you, do do you let YouTube change? I don't let it change anything I do. But. I mean, I, I've I've gotten to the trap sometimes of like, oh, there's this new thing out, I want to cover it, and I'll like break my neck trying to do it, and I end up you know not being so satisfied with the results of the the video, either the reception it gets or just how I put it together, and it's just one of those things where it's like, every, I fall for it sometimes. It's like, nope, you know, don't do that. You know, it's it's gonna bite you or. Um, sometimes there are happy accents where I worked on a, a video and I did the same uh, project that Sean was working on. And, you know, we chat all the time, but we don't ne necessarily say what we're working on at the same time. We'll send each other s silly pictures of, of a computer <laughs> crying or something. And I'll be like, oh, you're actually working on one of those? I'm working on one of those. And I'll say, oh, you know, what aspect are you covering? Because I'm thinking of covering this and I don't, I don't necessarily want to step on your toes, but I'm also like, did you get that to work? Because I didn't yeah. get that to work. And, and so I think it's, it's not more of like a competition of like, at least for me, of like who does what first, but like I want to make mine unique. I want to come at it from a certain vantage point or, or show something different. And I think that, you know, talking to others, if you have like a, a group of people who are doing videos together or, or you know of other people, it doesn't hurt to say, hey, hey I'm, do I'm doing this thing. Do you have any advice for this? Or do you have the driver for this or the software manual or something like that? I, I don't like being competitive because I'm just not a competitive person and I just feel like I, I would fail at the end of it. So I just like, oh no, yeah, I'll just do my own thing, you know? But yeah, or for the YouTube algorithm is just like a whole other story. Okay. Great. Yeah, and we might do that last. Uh, you're number three, how's that? So, question here. Hi there, uh, thank you all for what you do and when are you coming up to Toronto to World of Commodore? Been there. <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> Uh, Sounds fun. Maybe. Yeah. Oh. Um, you yeah, back there in the back, Chris. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, are you from Canada, from Toronto? Yeah, I drove down yesterday. Oh, wow! Thank you for coming. I, I was wondering if if you feel that there's a competition between YouTube channels. I mean, no. I I, I enjoy. Is David there any work? not okay. animosity per oh. se, but like, oh man, he totally. He, he got that before me, or he ripped me off, well, or there's, there's, I really meant to do that. There, there, I think it's like from a geeky perspective of like, oh, that's so cool. I wish I would have thought of that, or I wish I would have done that, but not like a mean-spirited way. I, yeah, everybody right. on, on this panel inspires me to, to do things and tinker with things, and, uh, yeah. and David will do a video. I'm like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Or, or Sean will like shove a G4 into a 68K Mac, you, you know. That. Yeah, and it's like, you shouldn't do that because now it's on fire. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I've certainly done videos, or I've had videos on the, like, back burner that I've been working on a little bit, and then, like, I'll get my notifications in the morning and LGR will release a video about this exact same thing, <laughs> or Techmoan, or whatever. So I've certainly experienced that, uh, and vice versa. Because um, I'll have them email me, hey, I was working on a video about that. But it's not really a competition. We didn't plan it that way. It just it just happens sometimes. So. The only thing Steve and I compete on is eBay purchases. <laughs> <laughs> we okay. message each other to make sure we're not bidding on the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how... Do you ever fake message each other to no. hit fake? Or... Oh, smart. Well, that, that's what happened with the Molar Mac, though, because oh, great. I, I, gave I, ideas. Found one, I found one on, on eBay, and there were two listed. And so the deal was, I get the, the one that didn't boot, and he gets the one that did boot. And let's just say my battery was very sad inside. <laughs> but cosmetically, it looked happy, so. And mine's now a G4. <laughs> I have a question for the 8-bit guy. I was wondering, what's your favorite com retro computer and why? No, you know, I can't answer that in the presence of Bill here, because, you know, I mean... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh... Uh, you know, no I, pressure. No. Oh, I'm real fast. A couple of years ago, uh, Bill Mensch was here, who is one of the co-designers of the 6502, and we asked him that question, and in the presence of Bill, he said Apple. Oh, he did. <laughs> oh, he absolutely did. He tried to rub my face in. No, actually, the Commodore 128 is probably one of my favorite. I'm not sure if it's my... I don't know. I'm trying to think. I can't think of anything that I... It would be more oh, favorite than the Lisa. Yeah. Oh no, I no, definitely not even remotely. <laughs> no. So we designed the 128 to be used by people like us. 
that's where mm. the two monitors came from and stuff. So it is actually a compliment to have you say, I'd like to you know, use it or I think of it as the mm -hmm. kind of computer I want to use. And when people ask me, like, what's my favorite version of Petsky Robots, I always tell them the C128 version is my favorite. And the reason for that is because, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, because first of all, you know, I had one of those growing up, right from the time I was 11 to maybe 14. And, and I was always so disappointed. You know, I loved the computer, but I was always so disappointed there was so few software that really yeah. took yeah. advantage of it. And so seeing my game run on the 128 and taking advantage of all of those things that my 12-year-old self would have been mind-blown about, you know, uh, that's why it's my favorite version. Uh, you know, so, yeah. So I think that... Cool. Cool. I, d I just want to chime in. My favorite computer is the uh, iBook G3 clamshell key lime because it's the best color ever. And if you don't agree, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the indigo is better. <laughs> I like purple. I like that uh, conversation. I hate to go back to where we were, but you were talking about um, the algorithm. Right. And I honestly don't know exactly how it all works. But from a viewer's perspective, I use my um, television a lot, or Roku, or whatever it is. Yeah, I do say. <clears throat> or Google TV. And it works differently on that than it does on the uh, computer. And I don't know why. But anyway, my comment was that I really like it when the YouTubers talk about another YouTuber that they either know or that they watched because that helps me bypass that whole algorithm yeah. thing. <laughs> and I do the VCF forum a lot and in the bottom signatures of many participants, they might have their little website or whatever, a link. So I can link to that and then they might link me to interesting videos. So I find that the YouTube algorithm gives me a bunch of crap. Uh, it doesn't focus my interest on what I'm really interested in, but if I go in and I subscribe, I do notice that I Great. start to expand that a little bit, but still a lot of crap. So I much prefer the community to refer the good stuff. Well, right. I would Same. comment a little bit about the algorithm. So I don't pay any attention to it today, but I used to when my channel was very small, when I had like under 20,000 subscribers. Because, um, let's face it, if you want to get noticed on YouTube, if you want your video noticed, and you're not a million subscriber YouTuber, you kind of have to make your videos about topics that are clickbaity, right? Even if you don't necessarily use a clickbait title, it has to be a topic that is, you know, very grabbing, very, right. you know, whatever. And one of the things when I hit around two to 300,000 subscribers that I came to the realization is, hey, I can make videos about anything I want now because I can make a video about some obscure computer that nobody's ever heard of and I don't have to worry about uh, people seeing and clicking on that because I have the subscriber base now. They're going to click on it anyway. And Because if I'd made that same video with only 10,000 subscribers, nobody would have ever watched it because nobody would have ever heard of this computer and have no incentive to watch the video. And so one of the things that is, uh, I definitely appreciate about having the large subscriber base is it does free me up to make videos about anything that I find interesting, whether the algorithm cares or not, because I have the subscriber base to, to at least, you know, I'm going to get at least a couple hundred thousand people watch it, uh, even if it's not, you know, Barbie that interesting camera. to a lot of people. So, okay. Barbie camera. So. <laughs> so, I, I was going to, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask is, it seems like you guys have all collaborated, the three of you? Uh, yeah, I, uh, Mike and, and Sean and I have, have tinkered around with some stuff, and, and uh, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> it usually does not go to plan. I would say it's usually pretty dangerous when the three of us are in the same room. Okay. And, then, and then we got Ron back there, and you just add him into the mix, and just kind of all goes to hell. But... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I I can't. I don't think I've ever collaborated with Sean, like We've directly. We've been on uh, Mac. Yet. Yeah, but I mean, like in terms of like a, just a regular video. I've that, called you out before. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I've actually like been face to face with Steve. You know, mm. he wouldn't leave my basement. I had no, to that film. too. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I don't think you and I have like 
I don't remember it because I mean I know Steve has said little cameos on your videos. Mm. So well, that was when I went to pick up things, and he wouldn't let me leave until he filmed a bit. So well, he know. won't invite me because he's afraid I won't leave. <laughs> so and and uh, David and I have collaborated. Uh, we did it remotely, but hey, that's the technology we're in. So cool. Yeah, and I think that gives an opportunity to anybody. It doesn't matter like where you are. Or, or what your technology is, or what your skill set is. It's like, hey, you could set up a, a, a StreamYard or a Zoom or whatever, and just like, <coughs> talk to people. Okay. Yeah. Great. First thing is, two, I have two things. One's a statement, and one's a question. Uh, the first statement is going to be, I, I guess we're reverting back to web rings. You know, we're not going to use the algorithm anymore. Just make sure when you build your web page, you have the counter there and a couple spinning construction signs. Um, the second thing is, you know, as your popularity has gotten bigger and bigger, have you been stopped in the street? Uh, notice, gotten you know, pictures taken with your, your fans and autographs and that sort of stuff. Anybody? Yeah, that happens to me pretty often. <laughs> um, I mean, not every. I mean, I can go to the grocery store on most days and nobody's gonna say anything to me. But you know, if I'm in a crowded place, like at the Dallas Auto Show or someplace where there's you know a thousand people, it's almost guaranteed someone's gonna come up and and ask for a selfie or. You know, sometimes even when I'm in a restaurant eating with my family or something, you know, some kid will come up or something and say, hey, can I get your autograph or whatever? So, I mean, that, that, yeah, it happens. I mean, not all the time. I mean, it's not like I'm Tom Hanks or Madonna or something. I mean, I, for the most part, I can go about my business, but I do get recognized pretty, pretty regularly. I come to VCF to be recognized. <laughs> I figure you all have heard of Commodore, whereas normally nobody's heard of it. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the nice thing is, is I'm so small that when I sit between Steve and Sean at our exhibit here at VCF, I have people walk up to, it's like, I know him, and I know him. I don't know you. I said, well, the feeling's mutual because I don't know you either. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, that's one of the privileges of being very small and insignificant in the, in the hobby is that people don't really recognize you. I will so. mention, does anybody in here know the obsolete geek? Yep. Yeah. 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 So, you know, he hasn't made any videos in like, what, four years, four or five years? Yeah. Like that. So, you know, he lives in town with me and we used to collaborate a lot and he just quit making videos one day and he told me flat out the reason that he quit was because he didn't like people recognizing him mm. and yeah. it, it bothered him. So... So, I mean, some people, I mean, you might not think that it would bother you, but it might. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's a story that uh, LGR told at Midwest of, like, you know, he was at a restaurant, he went to the bathroom, and the guy's like, I like your videos. It's like, oh, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it's, it's nice getting recognized, but no thank you. That's I, a little I much, yeah. I, Don't shake my hand. Yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been mistaken for Sean, and I'm like, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm that guy. <laughs> Here's my address, send me all the upgrade cards, and I'll make a video on it. Yeah, well, I pretend I'm you on all of my bills, so. <laughs> That's where that money went. <laughs> God. So we're literally out of time here. I want to thank everybody for coming, especially the distance as y'all came and everything. I want to thank everybody in the audience for listening and uh, give everybody here a big round of applause. <laughs>